Right. Well, if you were joining me earlier, I had some technical faults, and now I am working. So apologies for that. You probably just got a slight echo as well, because I wanted to make 100% sure that the uh, uh, video and the audio was working. But now I'm up. So sorry about that. Technical twitching. Twitching, not twitching. Yeah, twitching, tweeting, twitching. And uh, so basically, I'm going to reboot myself because I had some real technical faults there. The audio had gone completely dead. And um, now I'm working again. I've got the chat screen up. And thanks, Judge uh, Darren. Yeah, I'm now more, uh, I'm now <laughs> operational. Excellent. And so feeling much better. And um, yeah, I think what's happened there this week, I got a job this week because I've been out of work with lockdown and I had my first day on Wednesday, Thursday, then Friday. And during that, I had all the classic stuff happen, which is I had to join Microsoft Teams meetings and then Zoom meetings on another day. And all my audio was switching about. I had uh, a power cut as well in the middle of it. Anyway, uh, the end result was sat down to do the stream today and I had jerky video. I had the wrong audio settings. Everything was all wrong. So I'm working now. So back to normal. So basically, I'm going to make this so quick, the summary. Normally, I take 15 minutes over this. But basically, summary is I'm using all of the Goodman Games um, books, the Dungeon Alphabet, the um, Monster Alphabet, and the main book where I write this adventure online while I'm sitting here. So basically the uh, map behind here, now actually I can get the audio working, is called Scarpsy. I drew this out a couple of weeks ago and there's a key adventure going on where there's a goddess dying in here. Um, oh, Judge Darren, so you played in the 13th Skull Day. Oh, that's great. Um, and your handout of NPC characters for us. I was wondering uh, where you got those NPC character handouts. Um, I think I may have made those, did I? I think I made them. Was that these, by any chance, these little things here with all of the NPCs listed? Uh, if it was, that's what uh, I just sketched them out and then I scanned them in and I put them on a serial packet. So it was seriously. Uh, um you know making stuff at home really <laughs> but yeah I, I got little sticker i did use some stickers to to print them onto and then those are my npcs so there's actually the skull itself um now i did these funny enough i do these for my um i did a set for my dungeons and dragons games as well um and in hindsight in hindsight both of them need re-editing because both of them are a bit um a bit rubbish really i mean the dungeon and dragons one has all their huge stat block there with uh, stuff but the main thing for me while i'm tracking while i'm playing online is that i fill in the uh, damage boxes down here so if i've got multiple creatures um well, there's a character there's a, a dungeon and dragons flab giant i can't remember which book i found that in but uh, basically they have 120 hit points and because i got up to 400 hit points on the bottom of here uh, when i zoom in I can just uh, fill those in as I work. So if I'm playing the game. Oh, no, the picture of each NPC. Ah, yes, that was on these cards. That was online, and I found that on the DCC Rocks um, uh, Facebook group. They were showing those off. Um, let me see if I've got it in my drop-down lists. There it is. Dungeon Call. Oh, here we go. Uh, if I if I if I now switch to my Raspberry Pi, we can do a little bit of uh, look at that. Uh, because I believe I've got it here in one of my shortcuts under my role playing section. RPD, RPG, Dungeon Crawl Classics, Level Zero, Hirelings. That's someone called Julius RPG Cove. Um, and basically they took all the artwork from the Dungeon Crawl Classics books and then you just go to the website. So if you look for that, um, Julius RPG Co. Oh, no, I can actually copy that into the chat. Oh, no, I can't. I've got this on a different computer. Um, but then you just go generate zero level characters and it will give you a PDF. Oh, they're the zero level characters. And then you've got hirelings down there. So again, if you were um, 
are great for writing an adventure as well if you just wanted some weird odd bod characters they've put uh, names in here as well so wherever they're generating these from they're obviously creating the, the whole the whole deal um, so yeah that, that's a good little tour so again um, kind of relevant for this stream because I'm talking about adventure writing and this is a handy tip to use these so uh, Julius RPG cove.com and they have a whole load of stuff for characters so a bit like the purple wizard um tool but this one obviously they've done this thing where they put the nice little uh character faces and things in there as well good you found it excellent so yeah i'm now going to switch back to what i was doing and which is writing this adventure and if i shift things around a little here I'll get down to the next bit that I was working on. So I was in a dungeon. Uh, well, it's in a um, a to tomb. Just come up to the top. There it is. The um, it's probably written above there. No. Anyway, so this is this um, rocksmith tomb, and we were working the way through. Myra Meagles was a character that I discovered in Room Six. We've been in there in stasis, and she's like a cleric with a harm spell, and she's also suffering some madness that I rolled up. And then from there, we went into room four that was just a, a, a bogged down, uh, damp room. And then in room two, which had a large sort of carpet rug. So the last bit I did before we left last week on that room two was I, um, so the hallway is there. And then room two, the antechamber, it contains a lot of rotten sodden, sodden furnishings, carpet and rugs. Opposite the entrance to the west is a double door that is ornate and slightly ajar with both doors opening into the room, revealing a visible crack down the centre to a dark room beyond. Um, I'm going to just say that the large uh, faded red carpet on the floor in here is, is soaked with, with water and rotten much like the rest of the furnishings. So um, that's where we've. I've then said there's a poison needle trap on the open door. Um, why did I just say that? There's a poison needle trap on the open door. I repeated myself saying it. Open door. If, if someone reaches from the already ajar double door, it will, it will spring from the, from the edge. So DC, I'll just say trap, DC. Um, I just say 15 if they if they look at the edge of the door before they pull it open and you know, careful careful pulling of the door will avoid the spring I need to define that poison so that's one thing to have a look in the adventure in the in the book which is probably just do that now is just dive straight in here because it's always good to get a good poison isn't it at certain points so that's the monster alphabet although there are poison monsters and you could always use that to generate the thing there so we've got potions um i wonder if there's a creature that has a poison bite that we could use just to just to make things a little bit more interesting i also had one in here that they had uh, interesting monster blood uh, that could be used at the same time so let's have a dive over anyway to the desktop and then have a look in the i'm going to have a look in the monster alphabet for a poison just zoom out a bit because i can just see that i've uh, gone a bit too far out get that into focus there we go so yeah there's here um poisonous some creatures blood is toxic And I'm just randomly going to flip through because I need some inspiration and rather than just jumping on a poison I'm going to look at something that's interesting um, that may have an effect on someone 
So 12 insidious insect attacks, that might, um, that might have something poisonous, no. Infernals, layer, mimic, we had some of those the other week. Well, here we go. So straight onto the noxious uh, page here in the dungeon alphabet. And I've just seen something interesting in here that with a sputtering hiss, the monster launches a volley of frothy spittle. So I was just going to actually randomly use this to create poison. And then I'm going to just come up with a, uh, you know, a stamina save based on that. So um, there's a D8 in there, but I'm going to pick... I'm just going to say blindness is quite a, is quite a dangerous thing to have, isn't it? So I'm going to say that it's it causes a, a blindness, the poison, if you're hit. So if I go back to the desktop, there it is. So I'm going to say um, What should I say is the safely saying quarter I'm going to say fourteen and that's gonna cause causes uh, blindness. I'll just make it temporary. I think it's quite a good disabling uh, effect on someone coming through. Okay, save fortitude. DC 14 causes blindness for 1d4 minutes. Um, then I've said when, the, when a character passes over the centre of the main red room rug, they get a great sense of vertigo and their eyes are drawn down to a map stitched into the carpet. Now the map is going to be a map to the levels in the Oblix, um, actually built into the carpet woven in. So one of the people that was watching this last week um, suggested that the, it could be like a, a mimic in here that attacked. So I then built the construct and I used the, one of the octopus attacks from the main DCC book for this because it's got um, six uh, D20 action dice. So it's got six attacks basically. Um, and I had... Um, the carpet slap do 1d6. That's quite a lot for six attacks, isn't it? Maybe I should make that... Um, I think I'm going to make that 1d5, <laughs> even though that's not a great step down. And also, it's oh, it hasn't got that many hits. So, I, no, that was what I remember saying last week. I ended up giving it a relatively low wound factor. Um, actually, now thinking about it, given this is like a level 3 game, I think... Um, I should say like 3d6 is its, is its wounds, just to boost it up a bit. Um, I'll just put starting numbers of 10 in there for now. Yep, so there we have that room. So the final room, I need to do the final room. So basically, uh, if we go back up to that map, also I know another thing I can do here to make this a bit easier for me to see. There we go, that's not what I wanted. Nearly there. Right, so if I fire up the desktop again, I will have a look at the dungeon alphabet for some details on that room. I'll also get rid of some of this other stuff. So R is for rooms and that gives you sort of a general view of what the room was going to be, but I was going to um, potentially do something a bit more interesting in here. 
um, and have a statue in the middle of this room. So if we look back at the map and just go back to the desktop, we can see that that final room, that they've just come through this room with the, the attacking mimic where the entire floor in here is a red carpet that attacks, sense of vertigo in the middle, poison trap on the double door, although the door is already ajar because it's sort of rotten and old. If they just say, okay, we'll pull that open, they've got a chance of being blinded if someone gets caught on there for a few minutes. And then in room five, we've got a statue. So that's what's on the on the column there. So I'll go to page 59 for the statue. See how this sort of weaves into things. You may also put a relic, another relic in here, but let's have a look at the uh, statue table. So basically with a statue table, you basically roll to see the figure depicted initially, and that's a d20. So I'll roll that in view actually, why not? Yeah, just roll off the table like that. This is how I should do it. Slightly on an angle, but number nine, Oh, it depicts a dragon. Now that is interesting because that ties into the adventure because we have a dragon theme going with a, a cleric that is dead that was uh, her mace and she's buried in here as well. So dragon. So that's going to depict the dragon that uh, we spoke about in the previous session. I can't remember the name of it, but I wrote it down. And let's see what it's made of. Let's see if I can make this work so that it doesn't. Um, it's not on a massive tilt. So it's made of um, stone. Woo! And 16 special properties. Ah, it says 10% chance per dungeon level. Uh, well, I'll roll it and see anyway. Statues decorated with gems or dews, removing these may have some dire consequences. So that's usually, that's a classic one. Let's roll again and see if there's anything else interesting. Eight, portion of the statue is missing. Replacing missing component will result in a helpful, harmful effect. Okay, that's, that's the one I like. I think there'll be... Um, something like a missing lower jaw um, from there. So that's one thing about this room, but I do want a couple of creatures in here as well. So if I just write that down before I forget. Um, so dragon, stone statue, and it's going to have a missing jaw, missing lower jaw. Then um, I'm going to go and see if I can find some creatures for this place, same place. So oh, that's a very reflected, uh, reflective uh, Cthulhu alphabet. So monster alphabets. So let's just randomly dive in here and see that we're going to get. Um, right. So basically, I could roll a d100 to give me a page. Um, I was thinking it's a tomb, so it would be undead, but maybe let's, it could be a construct or something. So I'm going to roll a D100 in here and just see what comes up. Now, 17, that just gives me a page. Celestial, <laughs> that's going to be slightly powerful. But yeah, it could be like an avatar of Celestial or, or followers or something. Why not? Let's have a look at what's on 16. I mean, it is good in the games, isn't it? So the adventures, you're meant to like dive in there with some powerful stuff. It doesn't always need to be just another room with a skeleton to uh, defeat. So here we go. Yeah, so there's a D7 now. So this is where we use the funky uh, dice. There's my D7. Look at the shape of that. And rolls. So I've got a six. So let's have a look. Village Vigilance against mortal infernal con incursion. Interesting, that sort of ties with the balance that we were trying to address with a cleric that I found in the last um, couple of rooms ago where there's a cleric and her uh, spirit has been placed inside a mace and I've detailed out what that mace is, which I'll flip to and I'll just go back over that. Um, because she wants to address the balance with that mace, so she's also was trying to kill a dragon and this happens to be a dragon statue as well. Um, so this is getting a bit interesting as in it's tying into the adventure that I was doing there. So, um, number six, Vigilance Against Mortal. Mm, well, that's quite interesting. And since, yeah, so maybe this is where we could leave a big hint that this may be some sort of local, um, the dragon doesn't like, perhaps, Idonea, something along those lines that um, 
and there's some kind of message to that. So let's have a look at these qualities. Another, another D7, seven for luck, gets a six. Powers, oh, I always like this, D20, let's see what the powers are. One, able to smite sinners from afar. Okay, I'll take that, whatever's here, whatever avatar or something. Smite from a distance. Maybe someone with a really, really long weapon, or it could just be some sort of magical ability. Um, body. Oh, so basically you can work your way the whole way through here. Now this is interesting. So we've already said that there's a dragon there. So maybe, maybe it is a, uh, maybe beside the statue or the statue. Maybe there's a dragon warrior. Hmm. Because the rest of the theme with the main dungeon, the Oblix, is all about having a um, kind of almost Egyptian theme with the the, uh, the main characters from the from the adventure being kind of unusually headed um, gnolls with a uh, you know your usual classic kind of eagle heads and things like that from the Egyptian theme going through it. Um, so it would be a bit different to have a a dragon. So let's roll it. D7. Let's see what it's going to be. Let the table tell me. Five. It's an ibis. Okay, so that kind of works. Ibis. So this is some sort of dusty defender of the... Um, or maybe not. Maybe a glowing defender or something. I'll work on that thought. But an ibis head. And the body is a little bit not here so yeah set d7 first of all six a lion body <laughs> okay i'll take it lion body and then why does it come to and then it says unusual color if you want an unusual color why not d7 again two gold well that kind of ties in with the lion So I'll just go normal. Or should we go D6 to see if it's got unusual limbs? Why not? One. One D6 again for body parts. Longer than normal. Okay, so it's a long, a long lion. With an extending neck. Why not? Because it's got that long ibis, long neck. That's what's going to have. And uh, let's keep going through. So eyes, um, D7 again. Six. Unusual number of eyes. Okay, yeah, I like it. Let's roll, see where they're placed. Six. Shoulders? It doesn't have it. It says roll the D7. And it only goes up to five. Is that an oversight? Roll a d7, there's only five. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm gonna roll a d5. Maybe I discovered a minor typo in there. So three, forehead. Okay, so this weird thing has got maybe six eyes in its ibis forehead. Yeah, so basically it's gonna be a bit weird. I'm not gonna give it wings. I'll give it, I'll roll on its voice. Uh, which is a d12. That looks like a 12. 10. Thunderous. Okay. Thunderous voice. Or something along those lines. You will cut off your legs, your arms, and your head. So we have a thunderous voice too. Um, powers. Now we've done this smite from afar. Divine instruments. Well, if it can do damage from afar, I'm going to say it has like a sonic attack, like a a cry. So, okay. So I'm now thinking that this room has the statue, but beside it is like an avatar of Iodanea, the god. And Idenea has left this guarding the statue. 
uh, with some sort of goal to because she's got something against the dragon. We'll come back to the dragon in a moment when I get back into the the text. Um, but maybe under its one of its um, lion clawed feet is the the dragon's jaw or something. And by replacing the the dragon's jaw, um, will give some sort of benefit for the dragon. So basically, Idana is trying to prevent the, the statue being made complete again. Um, but the characters at this point won't know anything really about Idana, although this avatar will be unhappy with anybody that's trying to make the, the statue whole again. And that's maybe where they'll see a little, oh, why is the, why is the, uh, the lion stood on the uh, lower jaw, a stony lower jaw of that dragon? Will they want to fight it? And afterwards, will they make that dragon whole again that's going to be interesting but and the classic way that i have been doing i now need to find some stats for it and actually give it some sonic attacks and things so if i go to the main book um, and then just have a look for some beasts like i'll have a look for lion and then i'll just have a look for say a sonic attack or something in there as well and then i'll do the stat block for this creature so get to the monsters the standard ones snake troglobites lion's going to be in here somewhere slug So we have living statue. That's interesting. We have lizard man, manticore, leech. I think like the normal creatures are in a, like a slightly different back section or something. Like a look here for like standard beasts bit. And for life and I can't remember. Men and magicians, nobles. No, that's not it. Griffin. You know what, a griffin would actually probably be a good base for this creature because it's got an ibis face, it's got many eyes, but it's got a lion's body. Um, you know, griffin's pretty close to that, isn't it? It's just a slightly hybrid griffin with a weird long neck and beak. Um, so it's going to have like a long reach. Um, but it hasn't got wings. We've said already it's like a normal lion, so we'd basically be removing the... Um, We'll be removing the wings and the flight and that speed that comes from the wings, but we'll be adding on a sonic attack because I said it had like a, a weird booming voice. Um, okay, so I'm going to use the Griffin stat block and move over and do that. Oh, the desktop has gone blank. So here we have the desktop and there we are. We're in room five. The statue is a dragon, which we've worked out. And we found that the something is defending or standing on the lower jaw of the dragon that's been removed from the statue for some reason or another. And we'll get down to that section here. So Myron Eagles, Tomb, Area 2. And it was Area 5, wasn't it? So basically, if I, I'd like to take a copy of that whole area because I, I need a snap block as well and just repeat that. and um, stick it in after the rug special attack. Basic copy and pasting techniques. Oh dear, I think I've put it into the header. That's not a good move. Didn't like that at all. That's better. Let me, let me get my book out of the way, but leave it there with the uh, griffin. That's better. Move the keyboard up. Sorry about this. Technical failures with uh, inability to organise myself. So we were saying area five. So... Obviously, we're going to find out here that because there's a dragon statue, and this is in the tomb of the Rocksmith family, it's obviously that uh, clear. That they've had some sort of relationship with the dragon as a family here. So I've completely lost that there. Entrance hall, antechamber. 
Spike Lily Construct and then the main burial chamber for some reason I, it just didn't copy for me there let me let me get that back again or I'll undo actually that's easier I'll just do an undo I think what I managed to do somehow is like paste the block of text over the over the drawing or I've gone into the header mode that's not wise because I'll get that now on every page undo undo sorry about that technical failures I do not want to place a block of text in every single header I'm going in here to avoid, even though it's not in the right order, to avoid any hassle just so I can write it in at the moment and then work on it in a minute. In terms of layout, got it. So this is now going to be area 5. Worship room. A large room with a large room with dry and cracked flagstones. Hi Robin, a bit like a chimera sort of thing. Yes, yeah. Hi Mark. Okay, chat's not on. Apparently, have a good one. No chat's there. I can see you. Just um, um, focused on the book at the moment. But thanks for popping in and saying hello. So a large room with dry and cracked flagstones, the with a raised central area where a ten foot dragon statue made of stone is standing. So then I will just say uh, attention is immediately drawn to a golden, a golden glowing beast that has curled around the base of the dragon. I'll just say the beast. Oversized lion. Neck. A lengthy beak. And half a dozen eyes. Lock on to whoever entered the room. So basically, we'll say there no, we want locked on, lock on to everything in the room. So in the block below, we'll say here. Uh, this this beast is an avatar. The name has left it here. So to guard to guard the dragon statue, and the dragon spelled here wrong. A dragon we can go up to see what that dragon is but I'll just write in there so we'll call it ibis avatar for 
now in terms of what the creature is. And I go a bit further up to read about the dragon again, which was uh, part of another. So here we go. The head of a dragon family that Yenis was fighting, and this was the cleric that died and her spirits in a mace that the characters can find in the main tomb of the throne room. Um, it's a mostly black dragon with grey patches on the back and head. Her breath of its light being sand blasted by volcanoes, pyroclastic flow. And her name is, is what I'm looking for here, is um, Gak. Gak Laganthorn. Gak Laganthorn. Okay, bit of a mouthful. May reduce that later to make it easier to read. So here it is. So the beast is an avatar of Idenir. She is left here to guard the garden statue of Gaclaganthorn, um, who's a dragon, who is currently residing beyond and the place is called Copenhagen. So um, what does it mean for the plot and what goes on here though? So basically the statue who is currently residing to the north who is still who is an ancient Black dragon still alive and currently residing in the north beyond Copenhagen. So I'll then say the Rocksmith family worship the dragon and by placing and by placing her statue. To her. So then I'll say something about Idenair. So Idenair um, has broken the statue, which also so Gak. Ganthorn and has left her avatar here to, to prevent so before I say that I need to mention the statue it's lower jaw removed and uh, the broken broken part is beneath but I just broken the statue which also breaks the family what's going on and has left our avatar here to prevent the statue from being made whole again. So, Ibis, Griffin, let's do this stat block. So, basically, initiative of a Griffin. So, I'm just taking it from the book, plus two. Um, this thing's alignment's going to be, um, I'm going to say it's going to be lawful. Because it's the goddess's representation. It's going to have high AC, like the Griffin. And 70, 10 hit points. But I'm just going to give it a, I'm going to give it a movement of 40 because it's not going to be able to fly 80, but it's going to move very swiftly on the ground, I'll say. Then its attacks are 
Well, it's going to have that beak, beak stab, like a spear, essentially. Um, if I can spell beak right. Beak stab. Oh, beach stab. Um, let's think about also the fact it's going to have a claw and it's going to have a sonic attack. Um, so I'm not so sure now it needs a full beak attack. So yeah, let's go sonic. Uh, so it's a sonic spear because it's got a thunderous voice. Um, so it's going to like scream from the beak and have like a a striking sonic spear that kind of comes sticking out. We'll go for that. And then otherwise it will have its claws from its lion body. So if I say the sonic spear can strike at a far, so basically it's going to be a ranged attack. Um, but we'll, we will make it um, the same. We'll sort of follow the, the Griffin stats. So that's a plus nine and the damage is 2d6. So it's going to be quite nasty. Um, and then the claw itself on here is plus five. And I imagine it's near like a D8. Let's have a look. That's one D6. Six. six. And action wise, it's going to have two, two D20 action dice. So it can either, you know, it could do two, two claws. So two D20 action dice. And I'll just say claw times two. And so I know that. And I haven't got my calculator up to work. What I do is I work out the average of the 7d10 and I shove that into the hits. But I'm not going to do that at the moment. So I don't have it to hand. So fortitude is going to be seven and then eight and then four for the so plus seven. Wow, this thing has got some fortitude. And great reflex too. And then plus four. Oops. So great will save as well. They're generally good all round. Um, AC, and it, that's all done. So now I'll write it up underneath to describe it. Um, the Ibis Auditor. So, Tar of Idonea. I could come up with a better name, couldn't I, than just Ibis. I could call it Sonic. Sonic Aviation. <laughs> Sonic Aviator, that's like totally not appropriate. But it's also not a construct, so I'll just say that it's um, um, a beast. Right. Oh, it's also Celestial, isn't it? But we'll, we'll write that up later. So Ibis of Avatar of Idonea. Um, this monster has a, a, an oversized, and I'll just say something like eight foot long lion's body, long head, long head, long neck, and head of an ibis. Uh, has a booming thunderous uh, screech that is paired with a sonic spear that can be screamed <laughs> out to a range of, as I say, th 40 foot, well, 60 foot. Let's say um, it's typically. Oh, the other thing is um, the head has six eyes to lock onto entering the room. Not entering the room, you can look which lock onto target.
not sure whether I need to give it anything special for having the multiple eyes because it's got the sonic sonic attack. The RBT has six eyes, just like those multiple targets. Um, the long slender. Maybe five foot long. So we're looking okay there. We've done the creature. Um, I need to put its base stats on, but I'll work that out once I've just got the averages and then I'll drop that in there later. I haven't got the right web page up I normally. I've got a good one for sorting that out on dice where you just put the number of tens in the, or the number of whatever it is and it'll give you the average um, total and I normally stick that in there. But I might ramp it up a bit as well depending on what the uh, monster is. Now the only thing is, is whether it could do more than one sonic spear um, around. Um, I'll tell you what the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say the sonic spear can go through walls just to make it just a little bit more interesting. So if I say special um, sonic spear, uh, once per round, the ibis avatar, for want of a better word, I need to think of a name for it. The ibis avatar will or scream with a thunderous how releasing the spear of sound. And I'll just see, and I'll say this, this visible if I can get my keyboard in order. Let's move down as well so we can see where we are. This visible streak or should I say wave, let's say this visible wave of um, piercing sound can target out to 60 foot and there we go this is the feature of its eyes and due to and now I'll just say and the ibis both C and fire its screeching spear of sound through walls up to a thickness of let's just say five foot. So yeah, that's the special ability that all these multiple eyes has given this goddess, god, uh, goddess's um, avatar. So just give that some bold. So I'm quite happy with that. I mean, it's basically a griffin with an ibis head uh, with multiple eyes and a long beak, and it's shooting a stream of sound that comes out like a spear. Um, so uh, the only other thing is to just mention, so. So I've said Idina has broken the statue, which are all, which breaks the family bond to Gaglagan Thorn, the dragon, and has left her avatar here to prevent it being made whole again. And it's worth just saying, uh, let's just say the avatar will not attack unless um, the statue, unless... unless it is either attacked itself or someone approaches within 10 foot of the statue. So basically they can creep around the room. What the hell's going on? There's this moving lion thing wrapped around the base of a dragon stone dragon statue. The only thing I'm going to say about the stone dragon statue is because it's a, a black dragon um, itself, I'm going to say the stone is also black. So I'm going to say that a dragon statue made of mottled black and grey granite and it just gives it a little bit of flavour to, uh, and does link back to the fact that the dragon itself is a black one, um, kind of a, lives in a volcano in, in Kobanark as well. So yeah, that's, that's that. Um, 
that's that final room done. It does link back. What I haven't said is what happens when it's made whole. Um, so what happens when the jaws put on and they defeat the um, the beast? So I need to probably just drop a little note in here. So uh, let me just say if the dragon's uh, lower jaw is replaced. Uh, then I can say Gak or Gan's thorn will be alerted to the presence of Idonea, the god, and will immediately and will and will rise <laughs> from her ancient slumber to investigate. The oblex um, until so with the jaw with the statue incomplete um, Gaglagan's thorn has been blind to the presence within her territory. Got that's about right. So yeah, basically if we fire up the uh, map, just to talk through that, so essentially north of Coban Arc at the top of that map there, let me actually go to the one on the table because I can scribble, uh, well sort of talk through it on the table as well, which makes a little bit more sense. Um, yeah, so there's the map. So north of Kobanark up here, we have the um, the dwarfs, and to the north of here is where that dragon is. And I haven't featured that on the map yet because it just sort of came up from the last uh, couple of sessions that there was a dragon in the area. Um, but at the moment, they're in the barrows here, and the Roxis, Rocksmith's family obviously owed some kind of fealty to the dragon or were, were worshipping it or something. Maybe they just made offerings to it in, in the older times. But the dragon itself is dying, which I've mentioned before in a previous session. Plus, uh, I don't know, the goddess is dying. And they've kind of become bonded while their, their hearts are slowing and dropping to a slow beat. Or maybe they're not aware of each other's presence. So, so well, obviously, I don't know, is aware of the dragon. Um, but the dragon has been blinded from viewing this area of her territories and maybe hasn't paid it much attention recently um, during the last... 50 to 100 years because that statue has been broken and her bond doesn't give her sight oversight of this area anymore with uh with the statue being made whole again if they pick up the lower jaw and place it on the bottom of the statue um it's going to come looking so that's going to be the trigger now that's a bigger part of the story it may even not pay part in this initial adventure that happens in the oblix um, but essentially it does mean that there's a little bit of an interesting piece here and the, the players may want to not bother putting the statue back together or they may get beaten by the uh, um, uh, from the creature in there anyway which we've just defined the ibis avatar by using the book so yeah so i um i'm just going to finish a little bit early because i i was already actually i'm near the end of my slot anyway but um which I'll do a quick recap before I go anyhow, but I'm glad I've now basically nearly finished every room in the barrow. I've got one more creature, which I was going to do like the ghost of the um, the old priestess cleric that had died in here. And she was like a fighter of the dragon. She was trying to bring balance back to the area. So her ghost is remaining. And I was going to make her ghost like something that could potentially go along with the party. Um, because she's sort of bound to her mace and her spirit. So when they walk into the room, if they've carried the mace in there, they'll draw her attention as well. That's if they've picked up the mace from the other room. And I'll just go back through what that mace is. Um, essentially in the main um, burial chamber in here. So where is it? So Barrow Area 1, which is the main burial chamber, it's lined with memorials to the Rocksmith family, the floor is covered in inscriptions, scribal ancient scrolls. And I'm also going to say, at this point, it's also, um, and various, 
and a range of winged winged dragon dragon forms are also featured are fe I'll just say are featured a feature of the oops um, no let's just say of the floor so oops so essentially it's again hinting that they had some kind of dragon worship in there but i'm going to say unlike the rest of the barrow this floor is tiled in rock in the same black obsidian as the oblix toward the east end of the chamber is a large memorial stone covered in glowing blue glyphs that are very small objects including a shield mounted in the memorial stone so as far as the characters and players are concerned it looks like that shield's mounted on the stone but we rolled up to say that it was actually strongly magnetic so anything within 20 foot of the glowing stone players will feel all metallic objects are drawn to it. To avoid the pull of stone, they'll need to make a reflex stay as a DC at 20 foot. Uh, any failure will see a random item fling from their arms and clang to position on the rock. And then a DC 20 required to remove it. And I could just say something like multiple characters can work together to remove locked on items. And then I've said the glyphs required uh, require a wizard to make an arcane check of DC to understand the meaning. They described a spell and ritual of death, which is slowly killing Iodinia, the goddess in the Oblix. She has survived a thousand years resisting the spell. However, she is now weeks left before she expires. If the characters explore the glyphs, they will notice the name Iodinia is mentioned several times. So basically, these guys like the dragon, but don't like the goddess Iodinia. So that's the situation. And then on the lower surface, there's carved an image of the oblix. Unusually, oblix is featured within what looks like a rolling dune landscape and has a large structure with stairs. So this is where the oblix was before it was transported here. And then items pinned on the memorial stone include, and this is just basically a range of um, treasure that they can get. But the main one is the unseen retribution, which is a mace. So I'm just going to make that a little bit more obvious here. Unseen retribution. Um, so let's just say mace. Or I'm trying to see is it so, so intelligent mace? No, I'm just going to leave it there. A mace with a bone shaft and head detailed with a handle of bound with wire metal. Wire metal. Wire metal. I'll just say wire. Unseen retribution intelligence twelve. Vocal and telepathic communication with Wilder. Yenis Deadlock is the name of the female cleric that on her death committed to continue to address the balance in the fight against a family of dragons, and her spirit is bound into the bone mace as a relic. Yenis can see invisible beings, however, she will have to communicate with the Wilder to point out where they are. Um, so if I just say special there, so we know what's special about it. When speaking, she has a clear, defined, calm voice and keep repeating the need to address the balance after. So the other thing about this weapon is if you kill something chaotic, you then have to address the balance and you'll be compelled to kill something lawful. So it's kind of the idea that uh, she was also after the dragon. But it's got dragon bane on the mace too. And the purpose of this mace is to address the balance along with a mountain range known as Cobans to the north of Scarpsea. And then I did a little bit of extra detail on the dragon family as well, which I can put into another section. So I think that's going to be it. So I've done a little bit more. I had some technical faults initially, so sorry about that on this particular recording. Um, but I think I've dived in and done a reasonable job of getting an extra monster and finishing that chamber in there. And before next week, I'll do a little bit of tidy up as well. And then we'll be back to the Oblix, I think, um, which is the main dungeon. So if I scooch down... A bit further we've got the oh I've got a bad stat block there that needs fixing uh, but the oblix level one I've done nearly I think I've done every room on this level one of the oblix that's already sorted including chambers on this side here in 3 and 3a where they'll they'll meet with Idenea the goddess um, initially seeing one of her dream visions rather than seeing her as an illusion that's one of her features and then I also started to do the second level within there as well, which will be further down. I need to do those stat blocks and tidy those up. And because I want them to have that sort of tighter, smaller stat block that I've been doing at the top. And then I've got level two, which has shrunk up here unusually.
That was great, Brian. Join what's your process? How did you make the map? I drew the map, um, the original map. Uh, so yeah, this one on the desktop. Thanks for for watching. Is um, that's I just drew that. So actually, there's on my YouTube channel. Um, there is a um, a whole section of this creation process where I basically sketch this out. I just used one of these pens and drew the whole thing out step by step. And that's basically how I started this whole process, just as a general tip is, you know, so like chicken and the egg, isn't it? How do you start? Do you start with a kind of a weird plot or something? Or do you um, start with uh, a map? And I started with a map. So I drew out this map and then basically worked through every section, putting the different uh, um, locations and filling them out. And then eventually, once I've got all the locations, it's going to inform the plot for me anyway, because basically I've got that kind of feeding in from this whole goddess theme that's happening inside the Oblex. So, yeah, great. So um, I'll just say uh, goodbye then, and thanks for watching if you've been uh, viewing, and I should be back next week. Plus, I normally upload this onto the Facebook uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics Rocks uh, Facebook group or up onto my YouTube as well. So thanks for listening in, and I'll, I'll shut down now. Cheers. Bye.